Yes, but this next company, um, I'll be honest, they have a special place in my heart because I am from Cambridge, England. I grew up in the world of the Sinclair Spectrum, which was um, designed in my hometown of St Ives, which is just outside Cambridge. Um, we grew up with the, um, the BBC Micro from Acorn, and of course, from that, span um, the company for our next speaker. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'm so excited um, to introduce Arm, and please put your hands together for Hugues de Vallon. So, hi everyone, a uh, very nice pronunciation, Jonathan. Yeah. From an Englishman, that's good. <laughs> I, I'm glad that's where in Germany because the uh, U sound in my name exists in German actually, so thanks. So uh, I'm going to talk to you uh, today about uh, um, the implementation of uh, the Trust Zone Security Extension uh, on Rust. And uh, let's see what's hiding be behind this really pretentious title. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, the Trust Zone for NVATM, what it is and what solution it, uh, it, it solves, it tries to solve. Uh, the, its Rust implementation, so how it is supported in Rust, and then uh, 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 a template project to see uh, how it is used. So, IoT systems, uh, for the main part, they can often be simplified to, to this really simple diagram. You have some main logic algorithms that take values from sensors and activate some actuators and communicate with an outside world. Uh, depending on your protocol, uh, could be uh, uh, on the internet, over LoRa, over Bluetooth, anything you want really. But it's really hard to make everything yourself, so what you usually end up to do, and because it's really easy, uh, especially uh, with the nice uh, package, man package managing story with, with Rust, you integrate components from, from s s some other places. You will integrate a, 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 a communication stack, for example, in embedded operating systems, your device drivers uh, through nice holes, but there is some parts in your system that are really dependent, uh, that are really uh, uh, specific, only, that only you will, will build, and that's what I call the, your, your assets. These are the piece of data or code that have uh, some security properties, such as confidentiality, authenticity, or integrity. And these are used, for example, uh, such as cryptographic keys to, to encrypt your buffer before you, you send them in the outside world so that nobody can see. Um, maybe some confidential data that your application uh, uh, produce. The thing is, when you're integrating components for a lot of other places, you have to trust them to, to not contain any bugs. Because if any of those components contain a bug, such as a, a, a buffer overflow, which can lead into some kind of return-oriented programming attacks, or attacks like that, we can lead to those parts, to those attackers, to, to be able to um, to, to read your, 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 your assets and modify the security pro properties, uh, it can be a, a big problem. You, you, as, a, as a one that, that builds the application, you don't want to, to give trust to everything that you put in, in your system. Uh, you want to, to put your assets in a secure place. And that's the purpose of Trust Zone. It divides your, your system into a, a secure world and a non-secure world, and anything in a non-secure world cannot access any data or code in the secure world. If it tries to, it will generate uh, what is defined in our VATM as a secure fault. Actually, this boundary is not as, um, as hermetic as that. Uh, it, it, it actually accepts uh, only a few entry points that are called entry functions, which I'm going to, to talk about later, so that your attack, attack vector is, only, is now only reduced to uh, a set of specific APIs that you control, that you can uh, audit, and be sure that they are safe and secure. So how it works in, in practice? Uh, when you boot in a MVATM system with the chosen extension, um, so you have on one side your secure project, on the other side your non-secure project, you flush those two binaries into your memory in non-overlapping addresses, uh, and your system will boot uh, in secure code. Um, the, the, the reset handler we will execute, and uh, it will configure and uh, map your system with secure addresses and non-secure addresses, and then jump to the non-secure code, the reset handler of the non-secure code, which will execute the main part of the application. Uh, for example, your, your embedded operating systems. But the thing is, uh, at, at some point, th th this part of the call, we need to, to access to the assets to be able to encrypt data or, or, 
or, or do things which are in secure code. So how to switch to secure state? How can the non-secure state be able to access to the secure code? And uh, the steps to be able to, to do the transition between secure or non-secure or non-secure to secure are clearly defined in the Anvitem architecture reference manual. To make it easier, uh, some features have been implemented in the languages such as C, and uh, which I try to do with Rust to, to be able to make it easy. And to start with, to transition from non-secure to, to secure state, uh, how it has been done uh, in C before, it with, it's with a function attribute. So you would have a, a specific function attribute, which is called CMSC non-secure entry. CMSC stands for Cortex M security extension that you put on top of some specific secure functions. And this secure function, and only them, which are called entry functions, will be the only entry point to your secure system from the non-secure side. So you can control and check uh, those functions that are, they are really, really secure. In practice, what this attribute will do is that it will modify code generations uh, of the function uh, to, to as I said, to check those conditions that the transition are secure and to do some more things that uh, I will explain later. For the other direction, if in secure uh, project you want to call a non-secure fun function, it also goes through an attribute called CMSC non-secure call. But in that case, it's not an attribute that is placed to decorate a function, but placed to decorate a function pointer. So, for example, it, it is used to decorate the uh, non-secure callback uh, function pointer here. And it is all the way and it, it, it will also not modify the way the function is generated, but the way the function call is generated at that time. And I will show how later. So let's take a very high level view of uh, the Rust compilation process. Uh, you have your, your Rust source code, which is uh, transformed by uh, the Rust compiler front end into uh, the LLVM intermediate representation, uh, uh, a kind of language defined by LLVM. Uh, where optimization will take place and where uh, uh, code generation uh, uh, will be done for all the possible targets. And all the things that I've described, all the kind of uh, code modification that are done by those attributes uh, are only uh, really the, the responsibility of LLVM. LLVM will be the one that will do the, those, those modification, uh, which is quite good because um, those two attributes uh, are currently being upstream into, into LLVM. Uh, so they will be available in the in the near future, and, and so the, this is good for, for for many reasons. The first one is that all the language that are based on LVM will be able to, to use this feature, and for for us as well. So our, our, my goal there was to to be able to make the the link the link between uh, the, the Rust source code and the LLVM IR. So to add the attributes into the Rust syntax, and then to use them to decorate the LLVM IR, so the rest of the, the rest of the chain is done properly. Uh, condition for that, because this, uh, these attributes are uh, for the trust zone uh, security extension for RMVATM, so which is uh, currently on Cortex M23 and Cortex M33, uh, it was needed to, to add the support for the RMVATM uh, architecture um, in Rust, so it's it's what uh, I did over the past few months, and now if you if you add, add the, those targets were via Rust up, it it will just work on, on the latest nightly. Okay, so let's start uh, to get into a, a bit of details of uh, those attributes. So with the first one, uh, CMSC non-secure entry. So as I said, this attribute will be placed on top of secure entry functions, and we modify code generation. Uh, into the, the following way. They will mark the function as a secure entry function so that the linker, when it sees this function, can place it into a special section that is marked as a special section for the entry functions. And just before returning from, uh, um, from a secure state, to not leak any information to the non-secure state, it will clear the, the registers. Uh, the good thing about it is that it's a, an LVM function attribute. And many other LLVM function attributes are already present in Rust, such as inline or cold. So uh, my job here was fairly easy, and it was just to, to replicate uh, uh, how uh, these attributes work and, uh, and, and do the same uh, um, for, for it, uh, just uh, copy and paste, really. So if, if we check uh, how it works, uh, we have in the syntax now this um, I mean, in, in my implementation, this uh, CMSC non-secure entry attribute that 
it used to decorate a secure entry function, here empty for simplicity. It will generate the following LLVM IR. So the interesting thing here to see that uh, the attribute is, is used to, dec to decorate uh, the function, LLVM attribute. And then when the ARM assembly is generated, it will do those two things I, I said. You can see there is another label. There is two labels in the function. So the first one is used to, to, to tell to the linker that uh, the function is a secure entry function. And as well, before, before re returning, so it's, it's all the body of the function in assembly now because the function in Rust is empty. It will clear all the registers and use this specific ARMv8 instruction, BXNS, to return to non-secure state. But uh, to make this pre presentation more interesting, we have a where things get dirty now. Um, the other attribute, the CMAC non-secure call attribute, is a, is a bit weird because, as I said, it, it, it's not an attribute to, to be placed on top of functions, but on top of function pointers. And wh what it will do, it will, so you are in secure state, you want to call a non-secure function, so you have to, to save your secure registers, push them on the stack, and then clear them so that you don't leak information. And you call the function, and when you return, you have to, to restore them. And as I said, it's it's a, it's an attribute to to be placed on, on a function pointer. So what it will really decorate in the LLVM IR is a LLVM IR call instruction. And here is a is a bit of the LLVM IR manual, and you can see that the call instruction can be decorated with function attributes. So, so to, to detail what the problem was, uh, I had to, to go into a bit more detail. I hope I will not uh, bore all of you down. Um, so the Rust compilation process uh, go through many different uh, uh, stages, uh, which are adapted for uh, many different checks that the compiler does. And uh, I really uh, group them here uh, to, to simplify a bit. So, uh, for example, the first uh, uh, two stages, abstract syntax tree and the high level representation, will do the lexing, the parsing, the type checking, and the mid level representation and the LLVM IR will, will then do the, the broad checking, optimizations, and code generation. So, this is what we want to do. Uh, we want to find a syntax on, on, the, on the top, top right uh, snippet to be able to, to, to find a syntax to, 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 write, to, to decorate this attribute on top of a function call. So here it is a non-secure callback uh, function pointer. So that when the LLVM IR is generated, it is used to decorate the call instruction. If we go uh, bottom up to check what is really used to generate this, this LLVM IR call instruction, we can see that it is in the mid-level representation, there is a specific node called uh, a terminator node, which will be used to, to call it. So, our goal now, we know that our goal we, will be to, to modify uh, uh, the way um, the, this node is coded and the way the LLVM IR is generated with this node to add the information that the attribute was there or not. The thing is, is that when going from the high level representation to the mid level representation, the attribute will be discarded by the Rust code. Um, it is fairly easy to add it into the syntax so that the code in the top right uh, will compile without any, any fault, so that the attributes will be there on the, on the structures of the compiler. It will be there in the nodes in the IST and in the node in the high-level representation. But then it will be discarded when uh, going uh, from the uh, high-level representation to the mid-level representation. So really, our goal here is to be able to delete that cross, to be able to that all the compilation process keep the information about this attribute. So let's, to do that, let's first see if we have this declaration of a function pointer and a, and a, and a function pointer call, what high level representation nodes uh, are actually generated. And I noted those three nodes. There will be one for the full let, let statement, one for the function call expression, and another one for the function pointer expression. And I saw that the high-level representation node, which will be actually used to generate uh, uh, the mid-level, uh, the, mid uh, um, the, the mirror, sorry, uh, to generate the LLVM IR. Uh, sorry, there is a lot of, lot of things there. Uh, is this, this third node. Uh, it will actually use the, the function pointer expression. 
So our goal here to, to link all the, all the chains is to be able to, to decorate uh, this high-level representation node so that then we, we, at every state of the REST compilation process, we will have the information if the attributes was there or not. So our question now is, how, what syntax do we use uh, in order to, to decorate that specific node? How can we modify the syntax on the left so that in the end, uh, the CMSC uh, non-secure call attribute will be used to decorate this specific node? So I tried everything. Uh, I tried to put it on uh, the late statement, but uh, the attribute will only be on this late statement and not be on the, on the other high-level representation node. I tried to put it on the function call expression, but still, it's wrong. And the final syntax that I found is this quite ugly uh, thing um, that is used to, to put parentheses to just decorate uh, the, the function pointer expression itself. And like this, um, the attribute will be on the correct high-level representation node. So the only thing now left is to make the connection, to add a, a boolean, uh, a boolean field in the in the in the middle of a representation to check that if the attribute was there or not. And later on in the process, if this boolean was true, then we can decorate uh, the LLVM IR. So let's see how it pans out in in in, in test. Uh, so we have now this syntax, uh, a function, a secure function, takes a non-secure pointer, uh, applies the attributes to it to call this non-secure function. The LLVM IR will be decorated with these attributes, so all good. And it will generate the following assembly. So here we can see that the first line, we push all of uh, the secure registers on the stack to save them. We clear all of them to not leak any information. Uh, we jump to the non-secure function with the BLX NS instruction. So it kind of branch with link, but added with the NS for non-secure. And then when we return, we pop back all of the register we, we previously saved. So to, to show uh, all how uh, uh, all of this is working, uh, I made a kind of template project that I hope uh, to be able to to, to upstream uh, after everything is done to show uh, how all the build system and uh, works with with those secure and non-secure projects, how everything uh, uh, sticks sticks together. So as I said, in, in, in a project using Trustzone, you will end up having a secure project and a non-secure project, which are which are totally independent, uh, independent cargo projects. They have their own cargo dot uh, uh, to tomel and their own set of dependencies and, and everything. They, they don't share anything but those secure entry functions. And this project is uh, is made to to I, I like to, to, to make it uh, be easy to, for everybody to use. So it uses a, a, a QMU uh, target which has a Cortex M33 processor in it. So then uh, people can play around and see all, all how the instructions are, are set and how, how everything is working. And it actually uh, emulates an FPGA uh, a system on the MPAS2 plus port. So the real name is here, and you can look it up if you're interested for, for details. So in this project, I made some several templates to check uh, how these things work. So the, the, the first one um, is to see that uh, how we how we jump from from a, a secure uh, code to non-secure. So what the, as I said, the secure project will do is that it will configure your memory regions and then jump to the non-secure re reset handler. And uh, it is what the, this code do. And the, the, the consequences of that is that when you are in GDB and debugging it with QMU and you do a breakpoint to the main symbol, you will stop two times. You will first stop uh, in the in the main of the um, of the secure uh, project, and then in the main of the non-secure one. So, as I said as well, whenever your non-secure code is doing uh, an access to a, a, a region in memory that is marked as secure, it will trigger a secure fault. And uh, using the uh, Cortex M RT library, which uh, define an easy way um, uh, to to um, to declare uh, uh, interrupts uh, and exception handlers. It's very easy to write the secure fault except exception handler just with the exception uh, macro. 
And I, I was pleased to see that the secure fault is already in that library, is already defined. So I, I didn't have to, to change uh, anything there. And for example, here the secure fault, what it will do is that it will uh, print, uh, just print a secure fault uh, when there is a, a secure fault. And in the non-secure project, to, to test this, I, I try to read a memory region that is set as secure. And you can see uh, on GDB that as soon as I execute this line, it will jump to, to the secure fault handler. So to fix this, if you really want to read uh, this random address in memory, uh, what you will need to do is that you will need to go through uh, a, a secure function that does the same and returns the value, but does the same in secure code. And this is how it's done. Uh, I declare a secure function that actually returns uh, the value at the same address. And because this value, uh, this address is insecure, and uh, the function is, act is also executing insecure code, everything is fine and uh, it will just work. So you can see that uh, decorating the function, there is this uh, CMSC non-secure entry attribute, and also the no mangle attribute. Um, I found, uh, I don't know if it's internet or not, but a nice side effect of this no mangle attribute, uh, is that uh, the function will not be optimized, uh, optimized out uh, on compilation. So that the, the function, even if it's not used inside the secure project, it will still be there at the end of, of, uh, of compilation so that uh, the non-secure project can, can still call it. Uh, the non-secure project will declare it as extern. Uh, it is using the foreign function interface to communicate between the two because those two projects, as I said, are total different uh, uh, Rust projects. And uh, to, to go further, one of them could be written in C, uh, really. And uh, instead of using uh, the Rust ABI, you, you will just have to use a CIBI to be able to, to, the link, be, to link between the two. And uh, yeah, as it is using the foreign function uh, interface, uh, you also have to, to use the unsafe block to, to call it. Um, and the, 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 the last thing uh, about it is uh, the second attribute, the CMSC non-secure call attribute. And for this one, I, uh, I created another secure function, uh, execute and print, which takes a non-secure function, non-secure function pointer, and calls it with uh, the parameter 45 and print the result. So in the same way, the non-secure project uh, declares, declares it as extern and calls it with a, uh, it's nice to, to be able to do that in Rust, is that uh, a, a closure, uh, which I think is not taking anything from the ex ex its external environment can be used uh, as a function. So I can just pass uh, to the secure entry function just this closure, and uh, in GDB it will work. The important thing to note here is that if I did the same, but without this attribute, it will it will also generate a secure fault. It is really to this is more like I guess a, a, an help to the programmer to say okay. Uh, if you really want to call a non-secure function, you have to, to assert it uh, with this attribute. So um, that's it for this attribute for, for the Trust template project and for my talk. Uh, thanks for, for listening. And if you have uh, any question, I'll, I'll be happy to answer. <laughs> so uh, the question was that the secure and non-secure project were two total different uh, cargo projects, so how do I uh, handle the linking uh, with them? So it's, it's a good question because uh, it's something I, I didn't detail, to not go into detail of the implementation. And the thing is that, uh, uh, so to, to start with, uh, th those two projects are not linked together. Uh, they are just flushed independently into memory, uh, one after the other. The only thing that will not work, of course, is for a secure function. So how do you tell to the non-secure world uh, where, is the, where is the address of the secure function. And to do that, it, it will be done by uh, um, this with, with this attribute as well. So whenever you mark a secure function uh, with this attribute, uh, as I said, it will put a, a special label for the linker. So the linker will uh, create a, a, a few instructions um, to say where it is needed to, to jump to. And those few instructions will be placed in a special uh, 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 in, a spe in a special section in memory. Now the address of this section 
will be given uh, in a, a symbol table to the non-secure side. So it's just when you compile uh, a secure project with secure function, you will have two things. You will have uh, your final uh, elf uh, uh, binary to, to load, and another file which is called uh, 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 vineyard's file, uh, .o file, which contains the address of the secure function, so that you can link it to the non-secure and it will work. So the question was if it's a runtime linking. It, it, it's, it's all at um, com compile time. Um, it's just that, yeah, to, to simplify, it's just that uh, when comp compiling the secure project, uh, you will create uh, this, uh, this symbol table with the address of, uh, of your second function, and you will give that uh, to the compilation of the non-secure project so it can execute. So one is compiled after the other, but both are, yeah, it's, it's, all comp it's all linked at compile time. Yeah, uh, so the question was, uh, how does this compare with the, um, uh, I think you mean the thread mode and handler mode that exist in, uh, in ARM architectures? So all of this is actually uh, orthogonal to, to this two uh, mode. So both in uh, non-secure mode and in secure mode, you can still have uh, uh, a thread mode and handler mode. You can still have privilege and uh, privilege execution. Uh, the consequences of that is that in both in secure mode and non-secure mode, you could have a, an operating system. Uh, you could have a, a, a non-secure operating system and your secure operating system um, to handle uh, both cases. So it's, 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 uh, it's still there, it's just uh, replicated for, for both states. Uh, so the question was, uh, does it pre provide anything uh, more than uh, what's uh, ex existing before with those two modes? Um, the question is that, uh, the answer is that uh, so o all of the uh, separation between uh, secure and unsecure will be done uh, by the hardware. There are hard hardware components to, to check for that. And what it does is really is that it adds a, a new level, kind of a, you can see it as, as a new level of privilege for, for um, uh, security. Um, in, in the same way, you could, you could imagine a system where you have uh, your non-secure state and your secure state, but still in your, se in, in your secure state, you have some parts of it that you don't trust. So that these parts you will put in unprivileged and keep only the real root of trust in your system in privileged and secure. So it adds uh, um, uh, even, even more uh, protection around, around what's uh, really important and secure for you. Uh, so the question was if uh, this applies also to the address in flash memory, and the answer, yeah, it applies to all the memory map of of, uh, of your system. Uh, um, the question is, is there, is there anything in the ARM chip to be able to to store data securely? And uh, uh, I, I don't want to say anything wrong, but it's not. Uh, what I mean is that it's not directly in the ARM chip, but you have uh, components such as uh, um, uh, uh, cryptographic components where you can uh, uh, store um, uh, store the secure data securely and only refer them with a, with a handle and not uh, with the actual values. But these are, these are components that are totally external to, to this and to the core. It's just, uh, yeah. Okay, well, I don't know about you, but I thoroughly enjoyed that. I've done some work on some ARM um, V8 systems before, and I think, um, I think that was absolutely fascinating. So please, ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for who?